right here, right now, every day. CIUT 89.5, the sound of your city. You're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. This is Donna G. The show is The More the Merrier. And uh, looking forward to speaking with uh, James Quant, a senior programmer at TIFF. And he's with the TIFF Cinematheque program. And we're going to be discussing Imitation of Life, the films of uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder. James, hello and welcome to CIUT. Welcome back. Hey, Donna. Yeah, it's been quite a long while. Yeah. And uh, we get to talk about uh, the German filmmaker, uh, Fassbinder, and uh, this is so delicious. His films are so delicious, James. He's one of my favorite directors by far. You know, this is the fourth retrospective of his films I've organized in Toronto. Um, the first was over 30 years ago at Harbourfront. And a very young Atta Magoyan uh, attended that retrospective, and you can see the influence of Fassbinder, I think, in a Goyan cinema. I mean, you know, Fassbinder is one of the central figures of post-war cinema, and he's had this huge, huge influence, not just on the Goyan, obviously, but on people like Todd Haynes, who remade one of his films, Pedro Almodovar, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and, uh, you know, countless young uh, artists, video artists, filmmakers, uh, choreographers, musicians, it goes on and on, have been influenced by him. Well, I want to set the tone um, for this discussion so people listening are included in what we're talking about. Yeah. So um, can you set us up with uh, an explanation of new German cinema that he and Wim Wenders and all of those um, created? Sure. Well, the German cinema had been great all through the silent period, and of course, as with so much culture in Germany, it was destroyed by the Nazis. Yeah, um, German Expressionism. Yeah. Exactly, German Expressionism, all of that. And that all came to an end with Nazism in the 30s. Many of the directors, in fact, most of them fled uh, Germany, most of them ended up in Hollywood. Uh, there was a strong emigre um, community there of German filmmakers. And so... It, after the war in the late 1950s into the 60s, there was this attempt in Germany to resurrect culture out of the ruins of uh, World War II. And so there were all of these uh, government uh, programs to resurrect um, television and film. And it's very interesting that actually the two of them worked very closely together because many of Fassbinder's films, in fact, many of the films of the new German cinema were commissioned by German television television and shown on German television. Very radical work. And so we're talking about a lot of uh, filmmakers who are still around today, Werner uh, Herzog, for instance, Volker Schlondorf, uh, a lot of great German directors emerged during this period. Fassbinder, preeminent amongst them. I think he was by far the greatest of, of the new German directors. Alas, he had uh, a very short life, a very short career, because he died of an uh, overdose of barbiturates uh, at a very early age, 37. 
to no one's surprise, though, I'm sure. To no one's surprise. That doesn't make it any easier. Yeah. Um, you know, I was telling the story the other day about the day that uh, I read of his death. I was a, a, a young cinephile in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, who was trying to keep up with his cinema. And I don't know that you can quite understand the excitement of that period. Of Because, um, you know, he was making four or five. In one case, I think it was in 1970, he made seven films alone. And so it was really difficult to keep up with him. But I went into the backyard of my house after reading of his death and sat and bawled my eyes out. And it was a very selfish reaction. It wasn't just that this genius had died young. It was that I couldn't face the rest of my life without new Fassbender films. But the thing was that he was so prolific, he had made over 40 films, that frankly they're still coming out. There are some films I have not seen of his because they're still being restored. Yeah, I was surprised, too, that um, he died so young and had made so many films, because uh, usually when somebody dies young, they've made maybe five films or, you know, ten, but he was so darn prolific. Yeah, the only analogy I can think of is Mozart, again, somebody who died very young, but wrote a, an immense amount of, you know, of symphonies and string quartets, Fassbinder was the Mozart, although I don't think he would appreciate that, no. uh, that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he died young, but that, there was somebody who really lived their life. Yeah, I mean, the, the cliché, the expression of burning the candle at both ends mm -hmm. was, was really true. I mean, he would devour an immense novel overnight and practically have the script written the next day. He worked so quickly. And he worked with a family, the same actors, the same cinematographer, the same music composer, over and over and over again, so they knew exactly what he wanted. And, you know, he shot his films very, very quickly. He didn't like to do retakes. And yet, when you see the films, uh, you know, we've been watching them again, they are the opposite. They are so beautifully crafted. They are the opposite of improvised or ragged in any way. And he succeeds in two areas that are my pet peeve for a lot of films that I think are bad. Uh, music and editing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know he did a lot of his own editing yeah. uh, under a pseudonym? And then he worked with a, a young woman called Juliana Lawrence, uh, who became his, his prime editor. And what's very interesting there is after his death, she started the Rainer Werner Fassbinder Foundation which is responsible for the preservation and dissemination of his work. And it's because of uh, that foundation that we're able to do this retrospective. Uh, to go to music, he had a brilliant composer, Per Rabin, uh, who he used time and time again. And, you know, the music is often very, very strange and very almost alienating. Um, and that was, of course, intentional because Fassbinder came out of the theater. He began in the theater and in his early career was very influenced by the theories of Bertolt Brecht and his ideas of distancing and estrangement and all of those things. And so he uses music uh, sometimes in almost brashly inappropriate ways to, to give you that distanced feeling. Yes, and um, I want to start with... Uh one of the films in, in the trilogy, the trilogy being um, Maria Braun, uh, Lola, and, uh, Veronica Veronica, Voss. and Veronica Voss. Because he's uh, watching um, these films, you hear uh, country and Western music. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was very influenced, as all of the young German directors were, by American culture. They loved American culture as much as, you know, just like the French New Wave. They were always decrying it and its influence on uh, German culture. But at the same time, I mean, look at the list of Fassbinder's favorite films. It's, you know, lots of film noirs and westerns and melodramas and romances from, from Hollywood. And that, of course, extended to music. And, of course, there had been this huge influx of American culture because of the aftermath of World War II. They were living, essentially, under American occupation, and that brought a lot of, um, of course, American soldiers and American culture right into their lives. And, you know, when you look at the fact that Fassbinder was born in 1945, the very end of the war, 
and he grew up in this in this culture in uh, Bavaria and you know what's very interesting there is his mother was a translator his parents divorced he ended up living with his mother and she essentially used the cinema as a babysitter she sent him to the cinema every day um, so that she could do her work and he would watch two or three and sometimes four films a day to stay to stay out of the house so there you see the formation of him as a cinephile you know what's really interesting about that trilogy that you talk about uh it's interesting on various levels but one of them is that he didn't really deal directly with nazism and the war until very late in his career he dealt with it very indirectly in his films but um it was only towards and you know we call it the end of his career he didn't know it was the end of his career he didn't know his life was ending but um that trilogy deals with first the war with the marriage of Maria Braun with this woman's rise uh, she uses the black market uh, Hannah Shagula playing Maria Braun then you get the aftermath of World War II in the 1950s with Lola, the economic miracle that happened in Germany and all the corruption that came along with that and then you get the sour sick aftermath of the economic miracle in Veronica Voss which I think is one of his very greatest films. It's tough to get an audience to that film because it sounds so depressing. It's about a drug-addicted uh, film star um, played by Roselle Zeck. Uh, but another interesting thing about that trilogy is all three of those films are remakes of uh, other films. Uh, Marriage of Maria Braun is a loose remake of um, The Revolt of Mamie Stover, a Raoul Walsh film with Jane Russell. Lola is a remake of The Blue Angel, the German classic uh, from the early period of German cinema. And Veronica Voss is a very loose remake of Sunset Boulevard, again, another uh, Hollywood melodrama. Well, um, hence the title, Imitation of Life, um, in this perspective. Uh, Talk to me about his, uh, his love of Cirque. Okay, you know, I talked about uh, these uh, directors fleeing Nazi Germany. One of them was a director called Detlef Sirk, who had made a number of uh, very good German films. He fled, ended up in uh, America, uh, anglicized his name to Douglas Sirk, uh, made a number of films, but is most famous for a whole series of plush melodramas that he made in the 1950s uh, for Universal Pictures, directed by, I mean, uh, produced by Ross Hunter and starring uh, Rock Hudson quite often, Jane Wyman, Lana Turner, uh, often very artificial actors, shall we say. And these are sort of over-the-top, um, very extravagant melodramas, uh, emotionally extravagant, visually extravagant. And for the longest time, they were dismissed or condescended to by um, serious film people, by cinephiles and film scholars. Um, and Fassbinder played a very central role in the rehabilitation, if that's the word, of of Cirque's reputation, because he fell in love with the films, the, the Hollywood films. And he said he found them the most tender films ever made. He said something to the effect that um, that Cirque loved people the way no other director could. And he remade some of his films. Um, Ali Fear Eats the Soul um, is a direct remake of All That Heaven Allows, in which Rock Hudson plays a, a young um, naturalist, a gardener, who falls in love with a uh, older widow and she finds her very repressed emotional life opened up completely by this natural man and uh, so that's why I chose the name Imitations of Life partly because Fassbinder loved Cirque so much paid homage to him every chance he could get um, and uh, the fact that Imitation of Life is one of Cirque's greatest um, films now, the, the role of women um, in his films, at the time, uh, some feminist groups uh, disagreed with what he was doing. Um, I, on the other hand, see these amazing women who are at the forefront of his films, are very human, and uh, definitely not put on a pedestal, but uh, very strong women. I totally agree with you. And, you know, again, like Cirque, it's often a woman-centered cinema. I mean, the trilogy that you talk about, uh, you know, they're they're all named after three women, the three central women, very powerful uh, women, despite their weaknesses. 
And, uh, you know, he often dealt with misogyny in his films, for instance, in Katzelmacher, one of his very, very early films, and it can be tough sometimes to watch. Um, but it, there's a difference between depicting misogyny, critiquing misogyny, and and uh, being okay with it. Um, and, he, you know, he, he uh, was always concerned about women being constrained by society, being smothered by social codes. And one of his greatest films, Effie Briest, where he took a very famous um, German novel by Fontaine and made it into this incredibly beautiful, sumptuous, two-and-a-half-hour um, portrait of a, very, a young teenager who's married off to a much older man, uh, lives in a seaside uh, town, and she is so repressed. Her, her her natural energies are so repressed in this role that she uh, undertakes a, an affair, and the social codes, the Prussian so, social codes, come into effect and, and essentially crush her. Uh, and you know, it, it fits with Madame Bovary and Anna Karenina as well, you know another portrait of a, a woman destroyed by social constraint. This was always one of his great concerns. I think what a lot of feminists object to, and this is a wider issue in Fassbinder cinema, is he had a very corrosive vision of how human relations worked. One of his themes is stated in the title of uh, one of his early television films, I Only Want You to Love Me. His films were often about the desperate desire for the desperate pursuit of love and the abasement that people would go to in that uh, search for love. And um, he often uh, showed victims colluding in their own victimization, in their own abasement. And, you know, despite the fact that there are, yes, all these very strong women characters that you talk about, you get a film like Martha, uh, which has one of his great actresses. You know, he had this uh, troupe of great actresses, Hannah Shigula, Erm Herman, and Margaret Carstensen, I think is one of the great ones. Um, and you see the total abasement of this woman. It's almost like um, it's almost like a remake of Gaslight in that it's a, a young woman who's very much in love with her father, and after he dies, she takes uh, she's married off to an older man who is essentially um, a vicious psychopath. And uh, I, again, I think feminists would object to the fact that you know she doesn't fight back, that she actually colludes in her own victimization. Well, there is a part, um, speaking to that, uh, there is one of the films, I think it's uh, Maria, where she knows that uh, the boss is going to come on to her, and she says she's doing a preemptive strike with that. <laughs> <laughs> that, not, that not, would, in, not in those no, terms, but... No, no in, 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 in these days that we have Trump foremost in our minds, that isn't a joke that's going to go over very well. No, absolutely not. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, that was Fassbinder. There is this element in his work of provocation. He was... I wouldn't say first and foremost like Werner Schroeder or, or uh, Rosa von Praunheim to think of two other gay filmmakers. And we haven't yet mentioned this very central fact that he was gay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, one of the things that's so central to Fassbender in the formation of his vision is his utter alienation from the world. Um, you know, growing up in the aftermath of World War II, in the ruins of, of the war, and um, he he just loathed bourgeois hypocrisy, almost, uh, you know, the only other figure I can think of is Pasolini, who had that, that same vehemence. And um, he discovered very early on that he was homosexual. And, of course, this added to his alienation from, from uh, that society, because you can imagine 1940s, 1950s, uh, Germany, uh, well, any, anywhere in the world, but, you know, especially there, uh, despite the, the freedom that had been enjoyed by um, the gay community in Weimar, Germany, Nazism, again, had totally driven it underground and destroyed it. Well, yeah, there were uh, people forget that uh, there were gays in, sent to concentration camps. Yeah, there was the the, in, the, in the, the pink triangle. And, That's where that term comes yeah, from. Yeah, the pink triangle, 
Yeah. And um, it's interesting because the time he was born and the fact that he was making these films at a time when most people in Germany did not want to look back. This is absolutely true. One of his great themes, and again, in the trilogy that you mentioned, one of the great themes is um, cultural and historical amnesia, the desire for the country to just get ahead in the economic miracle, rebuild itself, and not look back, not face its Nazi past. And this was a, a general theme of the new German uh, cinema in general. I mean, when you look at the films of Margarita von Trotta, for instance, this is uh, another central uh, theme in, in her cinema, and it certainly was in his. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that um, his lover, Gunter Kaufmann, um, plays the American in some of his films. Um, but Gunter is a reminder of, of the past in the sense that he's Afro-German. He is a product of the war. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, of the yeah, American soldiers yeah. uh, that uh, that were stationed there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all the way through his his cinema, you do get those reminders, and it's one of the reasons why he was so reviled. I mean, he was he was a perfect case, and uh, this is unfortunately still true in our culture, where artists who are internationally acclaimed, internationally celebrated, are often um, ignored or dismissed or reviled at home. And uh, he was, you know, for some people, he was certainly almost a national embarrassment um, because he kept these themes uh, in the foreground of his films. Um, in A Year of Thirteen Moons, what was the reception like for that film? Again, it was, it was uh, pretty vicious. I mean, it was absolutely, if you look at the reviews, uh, when it was shown in New York, when it was shown here in Toronto, uh, at the time, um, the lead film critic, the most influential film critic in Canada, was Jay Scott at the Globe and Mail, who was a, a gay um, writer and loved Fassbinder's films and, and did a great deal to uh, make sure that his films were great successes here in Canada. He wrote that In the Year of Thirteen Moons was probably um, his masterpiece. I would certainly place it up there. It's a very painful film. There's no way around that. It's the story of a um, gay man who undergoes a sex change because his lover makes some demeaning comment that suggests that he would prefer him to be a woman. And the uh, nightmare that he lives after, after this. Um, and it's just this incredible performance. Um, you know, it, the, one of the, the central sequences in that film, it's one of the most famous in all of Fassbender, is where uh, she recites Goethe in a abattoir, a slaughterhouse. And, uh, you know, you always think, oh, there's... Um, uh, a metaphor that a director should uh, avoid because it's so obvious. But, you know, Fassbinder makes that abattoir his own. He gives new meaning to it. Now, I'm supposed to wrap up with you, James, but... <laughs> okay, Donna. If you don't have... Do you have to go or can we keep talking? For we a bit? can keep talking. Okay. I could talk about Fassbinder all day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so hang on on the line. I'm just going to do a couple of ads and then we'll come back and we'll okay. continue the discussion. Sure thing. Okay. Uh, you're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. I'm on the line with James Quant. We're discussing Imitation of Life, the films of Rainer Werner Fassbinder, and we'll be back right after this. Right here, right now, every day. CIUT 89.5, the sound of your city. You're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. This is Donna G, and I'm on the line with James Quant. James is a senior programmer at uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, uh, the TIFF Cinematheque Group, and there's a retrospective of German director uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder that's running, that has already started, runs this month, and then goes till December 23rd. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot in this um, section of film that you might want to, to, to check 
check out. And I'm enjoying our discussion so much that I've kept James longer on the line than I had intended. Happily, he's able to stay with me. James, you still there? I am still okay. here. <laughs> All right. So um, we just finished talking about the uh, the response to In a Year of 13 Moons, uh, which stars Fassbinder's lover, Gunter Kaufman. Um, so how did it play in Toronto? Were people okay or not okay at the time? They were okay. Uh, it, it wasn't hugely popular, I think, because it was such a painful subject matter. You know, the uh, BRD trilogy, Marriage of Maria Braun, uh, Lola, Veronica Voss, those were all hugely um, popular because they were much more accessible and, and entertaining. And, and uh, But Fassbinder always moved in these uh, these two modes. Uh, you know, he would make a film that was almost a bid, frankly, for popularity. Um, and sometimes it backfired. I mean, you were earlier playing Lily Marlene, uh, very appropriately, and one of his late attempts at uh, making a, a big budget, spectacular film, which, you know, he was used to working on a very small budget very, very quickly. Um, but this was, uh, you know, an attempt to make one of the grandiose films that he he loved of, you know, for Visconti or, uh, you know, Hollywood, on a Hollywood level, which is Lily Marlene, the, 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 uh, in which Hannah Shigula plays the chanteuse. And uh, that totally backfired because... Um, Critics thought that it was uh, an ethically stunted um, view of Nazism, that he had really crossed the line in uh, treating the whole um, uh, theme of the Holocaust, for one thing, because uh, in it she plays a... um, uh, a singer whose uh, lover is Jewish, uh, played by Giancarlo Giannini, and um, yeah, that was one of his, his failures. And so some of these more smaller films that he continued to make right into the very end um, were so personal. Uh, they were almost diaristic in that sense, and uh, you know you couldn't expect them to do as well at the box office as uh, a film like The Marriage of Maria Braun. Um, Hannah Shigula was one of uh, the women that was part of his his family. Um, Gods of the Plague is, is one that I'm looking forward to. Can you tell our audience about that one? Uh, I haven't seen that one in so very long. I would be loathed to, because you know what I, I discover with his films, and some of them I've seen a dozen times. And um, for instance, I just rewatched uh, The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant and um, Kasselmacher, which is one of his earliest films. Um, he, you know, his, his career can be uh, very superficially divided into, into four periods. And the first period is from what we call the anti-theater period. Gods of the Plague comes out of that. Um, and it's where he had this theater group, this theater troupe, and he used them, the actors and some of the technicians, to make his films. Hannah Shigula was there from the very beginning. And what I always find is uh, it's immensely rewarding to return to the films. I don't care how many times I've seen them. They always have a new emotional force. You always find something new in them. There are things that you forget. Um, and I mean, for yes, instance, a- 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 Ali Fear Eats the Soul. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it came on screen uh, the other night, um, uh, some of us gasped partly because it was a 35 millimeter print. And I don't know if your audience realizes how rare this is now to be able to see these films in the original format in which they were made. Uh, a number of very rare prints are included in this retrospective. And the just the depth of color and density in that image just makes you gasp. Um, but to the point that I was trying to make is that you know, I've seen that film a dozen times. It may be my favorite Fassbender, um, but it still had the same emotional force. I mean, you know, call 911, get an ambulance for me afterwards, <laughs> because it's so emotionally devastating. And uh, he also made uh, television. He made a lot of television. In fact, in some ways, you could say that his career depended on television, because in those days, 
there were uh, two or three um, television channels, almost like PBS or HBO, the equivalent today, who did a lot of commissioning work. And uh, so he got a lot of his um, money from television. And uh, an example being Merchant of Four Seasons, the film that really established his international reputation, he had a very strange contract there where the television station demanded, who funded it, who gave him the budget, said it had to be shown on television before it was released into the cinemas. So imagine that. All of Germany could see this film on their uh, state-run television channel um, before it appeared in the cinemas. And he agreed to it because he was so desperate for the money to make the film. That's interesting that it had to appear on TV before... This was just this particular case. I mean, there's a downside to it for us now, today, which is that um, some of the rights are very difficult to to get. I mean, he made a film um, called Nora Helmer, which we could not include in the retrospective simply because the television rights were impossible to get. But, of course, his most famous um, television work is Berlin Alexanderplatz this 14 hour, fourteen to 15 hour series that he did made over a year uh, which we're showing over four nights and we just were able to confirm that uh, one of his greatest actresses, the one who plays Lola Barbara Sokova is uh, coming to introduce the first two sections of that um, amazing series What a coup getting her yeah, she's been shooting in Toronto and uh, is in, in New York now, but uh, it's, it's great because actually the character she plays in Berlin, Alexander Platz, which is based on an Alfred Doblin novel from the 20s uh, and, and one that uh, Fassbinder was obsessed with since uh, being a very young man, um, she plays Mietze. And I think that Mietze is probably the most truly innocent character in, in all of his cinema. He has an innocent character? He has an innocent character, and it's only because she's innocent in Doblin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Otherwise, I'm sure he never would have allowed it. <laughs> now, um, there's a, a still um, of, uh, in, in the, on the website, uh, The Third Generation, where it looks like somebody is in blackface. Yeah. Now, uh, that is uh, one of his most controversial films, and not just because of that. It's because he was tackling the subject of terrorism. And, you know, you have to remember that terrorism was a central um, factor in the life of Germany in the 70s into the 80s with the Bader Meinhof gang, etc. And he, of course, uh, made himself very unpopular with both the left and the right, He'd done this also with another film called Mother Custer's Goes to Heaven. Uh, because he portrays this group of terrorists as kind of poseurs, as uh, people who really don't have skin in the game. It's just almost a thrill for them to be terrorists. And what you see in that still is them dressed up in one of their terrorist attacks. And uh, I believe there's a woman with a um, nylon over her head. Over no, her she's head. holding a gun in that still. Okay, but is, is she not disguised with a something over her head? Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the, the figure in blackface. So this is part of their disguise. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be, be working as a double critique because he would be saying... Uh, by his use of that, he'd be criticizing the use of blackface at the same time that uh, he would be using it, frankly, as a provocation. Mm -hmm. Now, a while back, you mentioned that there were four parts to his career, starting with the um, anti-theatre, you said? That's right, anti-theatre. Mm -hmm. Okay, theatre. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the other three? Well, the, the next one is probably your favorite, given your love of Cirque and melodrama. It's the Cirquean period, where he discovers Douglas Cirque and makes um, a lot of melodramas in homage to Cirque, uh, including Ali, Fear Eats the Soul. Then he enters what the critics dubbed, it was an imposition of a term by critics, not necessarily by him, the glass period. And why it's called the glass period is he fell in love, partly through Cirque, as we know Cirque uh, uses mirrors and windows a lot to frame his characters. 
um, growing out of that use uh, of uh, a kind of a circian mise en scene. Um, uh, Fassbender entered this period where he was shooting everything th in mirrors, through windows, through lucite, through any reflective surface he could get, and the image becomes very kind of splintered and baroque, and and um, uh, and his tone in this third period becomes little crueler as he moves away from Cirque. And so all of these glass surfaces, all these reflective surfaces, sort of uh, lend this this uh, tone of hardness and cruelty to his cinema. The fourth period, and it was the final period, though he didn't know it, I keep stressing this, is where he starts to directly deal with Nazism and its aftermath and its legacy. Uh, this is where he does the trilogy, where he does Lily Marlene. Uh, but he also, in that last period, um, did some major literary adaptations, um, one of them being uh, a film that I find fascinating, but I frankly will admit I don't think works at all, at all because its central conceit is literary, it's not cinematic, and that's Despair, uh, in which Dirk Bogard... Um, hires uh, who he thinks is a double, an exact double of himself, uh, to essentially get him out of his, his this life that he hates. And um, it's, as I say, a fascinating film, but I don't think that Fassbinder somehow got that this um, conceit that he deals with that's at the central of the novel really doesn't work on film. It's interesting that you mentioned that you find Veronica Voss a, a hard sell. I don't. I, it's a beautiful film, and is that the beginning of where he sort of transitions in, into the glass period? Because, or is it a meld of the Circean? Because there are so many reflective images. The, the, the you're absolutely is, right there. Abs, the lighting is absolutely beautiful. He never left the glass period behind. Okay. Um, he just incorporated it into these later political films. I mean, once he discovered this mise en scène in 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 Cirque, the use of mirrors, uh, you know, the reflective surfaces. You think of it. There's that incredible sequence in All That Heaven Allows, the Cirque film, mm -hmm. where the um, children, the, the you know, the vicious, they turn out to be ten times more conservative than their parents. They're like young Republicans. Um, they uh, buy their mother to. Try try to occupy her, and of course this was a big deal in the 50s, a television. And her image, this this sort of sad, um, entrapped image of, of Jane Wyman is reflected in, in the screen of the television, and, uh, you know, Cirque means to tell you right then and there that she is, is entrapped in this existence that her children want to keep her in, this proper existence as a bourgeois widow. And, you know, Fassbinder immediately picked up on that and started immediately using this, this same use of framing devices for his films. I loathe those children. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> They're meant to be loathed. Like, you know, it's so every interesting. Time I, every time I see that, I just want to break the TV. <laughs> well, you know, you get in, for instance, his film Katzelmacher, which is this portrait of all these young Germans just hanging out and and uh, exchanging partners and and bitching about the world and etc cetera, etc cetera. but what's so interesting is they're all young Germans in the 19 you know of I believe late 60s or uh, early 70s and they really are as conservative and as awful as their Nazi parents they are as racist and as conservative uh, as their as their Nazi parents I mean Fassbinder doesn't say that but it's just readily apparent yes um what's unsaid in his films is is is, is very interesting because it's it's there but it's not, um always lurking in the background and giving you commentary on the german society i forget which film it is that ends with the politicians the corrupt politicians at the end um where he shows them up on screen as being you know fake Oh, yes, the succession, the montage of the German leaders. I, say, I believe, I, you know what, if I say it's Lola, I'm going to be proved wrong, no, but I think it's I, Lola? I, uh, no, it's Maria Braun. Maria Braun, okay, Maria there you Braun. go. Told you. But, you know, um, we haven't really spoken about uh, Lola that much, and this is just a burst of, it's like a rainbow flag. Well, of colors. It's, it's, it, it's why it was so hugely popular. A, it's 
hellishly funny. It's such a, a witty, witty film. But one of the delights of that film, and again, it shows his incredible uh, mise-en-scene, is the use of color. I mean, the artificial color in that. You know, it, it, Every sequence is, is bathed in some sort of really artificial, I mean, <laughs> colors that you do not find in nature, let's no. put it that way. Um, and and that performance of Barbara Sokova as this knowing cabaret uh, musician who's going to get exactly what she wants, sets out to get it and gets it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, in a way, he's kind of reveling in, in her corruption. Uh, and it goes back to your, your observation about the, the strong women in his cinema yeah because she's living in a corrupt society and she's corrupt herself that's correct yeah yeah but uh, you know she does it very knowingly um and uh there's a certain triumph in that yeah but the colors are absolutely delicious i just couldn't believe it when it flashes from pink and red to green and you know the 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 whorehouse and then and shades of orange that you can't <laughs> yeah there, there are no words to 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 apply to those colors Absolutely no and then words. of course in the third part of the trilogy he goes to black and white a very chilly black and mm-hmm. white yeah um we haven't introduced veronica we just said it was like uh sunset boulevard so uh tell our listeners about veronica voss well it's uh about a uh movie star a german movie star who um becomes addicted to heroin and is uh uh, uh, supplied with her drug by a uh doctor and I will not go into the controversies around that figure because it's just, uh, in a way, um, too uh, difficult to to describe very in in very short mm-hmm. order. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you know, again, you see um, Fassbinder uh, being extremely provocative in how he treats the the role of the doctor who's supplying her with her drug. And um, Fassbinder himself uh, has a has a wonderful cameo in that. I mean, he he does appear as an actor throughout his cinema. In Castelmacher, he plays this Greek from Greekland uh, who you know wanders into this group of of racist young Bavarians and incites all kinds of um, sexual and, and racist hysteria. And of course, his most famous role, I guess, is. Um, the uh, the title role in Fox and His Friends, where he plays a, a gay man who uh, wins a lottery, which makes him very rich, but also makes him the, the, the prey of uh, a number of people. Um, so Veronica Voss is this uh, sort of black and white evocation of Sunset Boulevard. It has, and you know, you talk about um, the use of music. That has one of the most brilliant scores ever, where you get this rockabilly that uh, plays very prominently on the soundtrack in some of the sequences of Veronica Voss trying to go cold turkey. Yeah, and one of the things I've observed in watching his films, I don't know if you're able to talk about it at all, is uh, the way people, the costuming. Um, there's very much attention paid to that and how people are dressed. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the, you know, the, he was extremely detailed. Again, this miracle of the fact that he made these films very, very quickly on very, very small budgets. And yet, somehow, the art direction and the costuming, etc., et cetera, seem to be uh, absolutely perfect and also sometimes extremely sumptuous. Uh, again, when you look at this film that I've mentioned, Effie Brees, where it's set in 19th century Prussia. And in some ways, it's a classic period film because he has paid immaculate, meticulous attention to all of the period details of the set, of uh, Effie's uh, dresses, of her hairstyles, etc., etc. And, you know, he did a lot of his own set decorating. Uh, I mean, he... He he was uh, involved in all kinds of areas of his cinema. It was partly why he could bring things in on such small budgets. But, uh, yeah, attention to costuming was always a, a huge thing. And some of the costumes, of course, um, became almost, I hate to use this word because it's such a cliche, but I'll use it anyway, <laughs> icons. Uh, you know, the, the, the famous uh, image of uh, Hannah Shigula as Maria Braun 
in her uh, skimpy little outfit. I mean, you know, there, there's an example right there. Some of the costuming in Lola, um, you know, the, the bustier that Lola wears that you see in famous images from the film. Yeah, and uh, in Veronica Voss, there's beautiful, beautiful costuming in Veronica Voss um, that uh, that just shimmers in, in black and white. There's the word, shimmers. That film, I mean, at, at times it p- appears to be shot with nitrate, I have to say, um, because he worked with such brilliant cinematographers without uh, throughout his career, uh, Michael Ballhaus and um, Schwarzenberger, um, and uh, that film just it, it just shimmers. The 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 black and white in it is, is astonishing. You know, I wish that. Fassbender could have worked with Anna Magnani at some point. <laughs> <laughs> that marriage would have to, been incredible. <laughs> to, uh, to well, uh, she's she's uh, in an upcoming series that we're doing, um, so your audience will be able to figure that one out. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know about her sensibilities, whether because um, you know she was such. I you know I was. Uh, joke that she treated uh, Magnani treated the uh, tended to treat the scenery like a vast platter of antipasti yeah. <laughs> you know it's just like what can I snack on now um, <laughs> and that wasn't necessarily the style of um, uh, of of Fassbender's actors although you certainly have equivalences I mean Margaret Carstensen in uh, The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant this sort of um, lesbian slumber party um, is is pretty as the Brits would say OTT over the top so you you could be right there <laughs> anyway that's that's one for my fantasies um. <laughs> We'll leave it at the realm of fantasy. Yeah, we'll leave it there. James, thank you so much for doing this extended interview with me. It's been a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.